Risen Lord, uphold thou me that I might uplift thee. Amen. Well, hello there. So what brings you all here today? Something to do in between March Madness games? Maybe you thought there'd be some eggs still on the playground from the egg hunt and you wanted to grab them? I suspect I know why you are here because it is probably the same reason I am here. In a world in which God knows there have been too many tombs lately, in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Israel, in Haiti, in Baltimore, and in our own circles as well, perhaps we are here today because we need some hope, because we need to be reminded that tombs are not all there is for us. We've come today or we've tuned in online because we know we need the risen Christ and we suspect we might find him here in the hymns, in the readings, in the sacrament, and even in the faces around us. But if you expected to meet the risen Christ in today's gospel lesson, I'm afraid you are out of luck. If you listened closely when Deacon Valerie was reading it, you may have noticed that someone pretty important to the story is not actually in this particular version of the story. Yes, the stone is rolled away, and Jesus' lifeless body is not in the tomb, but as Mark tells it, the risen Lord is nowhere to be found on that first Easter morning. There's no Jesus. He's M-I-A. Now, other gospel writers tell us how he did begin to show up to the disciples. Uh, and, and even Mark, um, in Mark's gospel, some scribes later added on um, a story about Jesus showing up. Uh, but the other, the other gospels talk about, you know, a locked room in Jerusalem and Jesus appears or how there were some disciples walking along the road and he shows up and walks with them. Or they're at a seaside fish fry breakfast in Galilee and there he shows up. But Mark, the original Mark, gives us none of that. Jesus himself is conspicuously absent from the gospel, from the Easter gospel. Mark gives us an empty tomb, three frightened, confused women, and then someone with a message for them. And that is exactly who I want us to think about today, the messenger. Mark tells us he was a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right. The women do not get to see or speak with Jesus himself, but they do speak with this mysterious messenger who tells them why the tomb is empty and what it means that Jesus' dead body is not there where it should have been because he is no longer dead, he is alive. Now, all four Gospels have some version of this otherworldly messenger. Matthew has him arrive with an earthquake and says he looks like lightning. Luke and John say it was actually two messengers. 
But even though the four Gospels differ significantly on certain details of the resurrection, on this they agree. Mary Magdalene was there at the empty tomb that morning, and she encounters some sort of enigmatic messenger who tells her about the resurrection. This specific aspect of the Easter story and the fact that it appears in all the Gospels is no accident. This messenger character or characters, crucial to the story. From the very beginning, the good news of resurrection has been shared by messengers. And because of these messengers, this good news has even managed to reach us here today, thousands of years later. This morning, I want to tell you about my first experience with a messenger of resurrection. Now, I know a number of you have heard this story before. I have told it many times. But strangely enough, I've never told it from the pulpit. It was 23 years ago on Easter Sunday of all days. And I was sitting in a church filled with pastel suits and dresses, Easter lilies galore, alleluias ringing out, but I wasn't feeling very Eastery. You see, my mom had died five days earlier. She was my best friend, but cancer took her from me, and at 19 years old, I felt utterly bereft and lost without her. The grief inside me felt as if it might overflow like lava from a volcano and then calcify into a permanent state. That is what it felt like. Not very Eastery. I was very much in a Good Friday place. The world as I had known it had ended forever. And I was nowhere ready to face this new awful reality of living the rest of my life without the woman who literally gave me life. Easter that morning seemed, quite frankly, irrelevant to me in my grief. But somehow, I got myself to church, and I held myself together, tried to anyway, as, as we sang the Easter hymns and listened to the Bible readings, and then when it was time for the sermon, the pastor of the church of my youth, his name is John Collette, John stands up and begins to speak. And he began to tell the Easter story. The women arriving at the tomb, how they found it empty, and all the fear and amazement that ensued. Now, I don't recall everything he said. It was 23 years ago. But I do remember, he said something along the lines of how Easter is not just an event that happened long ago, but that it is also a promise. Easter is God's promise to us that even though the pain of Good Friday may be real, love always, always, always has the last word. And then what happened next changed my life forever. <laughs> because as John Collette kept preaching the message of resurrection to all of us gathered for church that Easter morning, I felt a shift inside me. It was not a shift of my grief going away, not at all. But as I listened to John finish his sermon in his methodical southern drawl, another voice began to speak alongside his. And this voice was quiet yet insistent. This voice said, 
I know it seems impossible right now, but someday you are going to preach resurrection too. Now, nobody else in the church seemed to be hearing this voice. <laughs> I had to assume that maybe it was meant for me. It took me years to come to terms with what happened that Easter. I was 19 years old. I had a lot of grieving and growing up still to do. But I clung to that message of resurrection that I received that day. And eventually, I did become a messenger of resurrection too. And it is one of the most awesome privileges of my life. So let me ask you, since you're here today, who has been a messenger of resurrection for you? Who has given you a word of hope in the face of evil and death? Who has shared good news with you when you most needed to hear it? And when someone has been a messenger of resurrection for you, how might you in turn be a messenger of resurrection for someone else. I promise you don't need a pulpit to do it. Pulpits are great, don't get me wrong. But the power of the Easter story has always been that it is best shared by tombs and gravesides or in ambulances and hospice beds in all the places where it might seem like death has been victorious. After all, it is by a tomb that Mary Magdalene and the others encountered the first messenger of resurrection. And from there, they become messengers of resurrection. They eventually tell the other disciples what they heard, and then those disciples get an experience of resurrection to share too, and they do share it, and they create even more messengers of resurrection. And Paul, in our uh, letter from 1 Corinthians today, he talks about how he became a messenger of resurrection, and each messenger of resurrection begets more messengers of resurrection. And thank God... Because in this tomb-filled world, where too often it feels like Jesus is MIA, we need as many messengers of resurrection as we can get. We cannot hear this message enough, that even though the pain and grief of Good Friday are real, love always, always, always has the last word. The messengers of resurrection tell us that although we may not see Jesus right now, he is very much alive and abiding with us. And because of his defiant love in the face of evil and death, my mom and all of your loved ones who have died are also very much alive and abiding with him now and someday we all will be too that's a message worth sharing amen <laughs>